Welcome to my channel. In this video, I'm going to be talking about Seed of Sarah, which is a female survivor account from the Holocaust. And I'm going to be talking about one chapter in particular, which I think is really neat. It's called Humans and Apricots. And actually, this whole project's about that very theme. In preparing for this video, I researched a little bit the pronunciations between apricot and apricot. I think it's just the difference between like British and US pronunciation. I don't really care, but uh, I'll probably pronounce it both ways. Actually, I've already done so in the video. At any rate, focusing on stuff that actually matters. Isaacson wrote this book and it's really good. Uh, I recommend reading the book, but also you won't need to understand the book to uh, appreciate the video. All right, so Seed of Sarah manages to engage with readers on many levels using tiered layers of elements throughout the book. The book has pieces that are incredibly relatable and powerful for readers because the author intentionally included sections that emphasize different perspectives. Isaacson highlights the humanity behind many events in her account using perspective layers. These layers become apparent when thinking about the ways a story can be viewed. The author's view of the past through the lens of the present shines through her writing. It might be possible to remember some events perfectly from wartime, although more likely the feelings and emotions felt during the time are more what she wrote about. Therefore, many scenes have the option of being read through the lens of Isaacson reliving the events in memory or living the events for the first time as a reader. Seed of Sarah includes a chapter called Humans and Apricots, which is uh, on page 51 it begins, in which the audience is given a terrible truth that compares fragility of fruit to human frailty. This struck me as an incredibly reflective and well-written chapter. What stood out to me was the overwhelming amount of rationalization that also doubles as stoic preparation for death. Isaacson seemed to have these thoughts that would resonate more with readers that have had similar thoughts. Her thoughts, whether they were principally about the horrors that awaited herself and others around her, rationalized the key similarities between fruit and humans. Isaacson's ability to encapsulate the delicate nature of life provided a layer that might have engaged some readers further more than any other sentence could have. Isaacson's narrative structure is broken up using keen insights into human nature that allow all sorts of readers to relate to her experiences. Apricots, like fruit, are organic matter that has an expiration date, so to speak. Despite estimates and guessing neither the apricot nor the human lifespan has a set or guaranteed date. This leads me to understand another potential meaning for why it is that this analogy contains further meaning, and that is the sweetness of life itself. The human life is not any given thing unto itself, although good things happen in life. The apricot could take on the situational meaning of embracing these good or pleasurable moments when they arise. Isaacson seems to briefly focus on the apricot, which might be a glimpse into appreciating small freedoms and pleasures despite her situation. No one can predict when the good ends and when the bad begins, but through appreciating the good fully, we prepare ourselves like Isaacson for the eventuality of an apricot squishing beneath our feet, or squashed apricot and the human body both share hair that covers their skin. Intentional or not, this seems very interesting because anatomically they have similar characteristics yet are powerless to escape their fate. The fruit lacks agency and still gets squashed. However, this story is told by a survivor who has escaped physically. But this identification with fruit might very well be an identification with her past trauma as she wrote it. Isaacson may have been safe in Maine when she wrote the book, but her mind was occupied with the war many years after it happened. In this way, her body was not annihilated like the apricot, but her mind and identity definitely changed from her experiences in the camps. The allegory allows a reader some insight into the reflection that can sometimes exist between past and present, and between the survivor and those less fortunate. The recent death of her grandfather probably allowed her to make the connection between apricots and humans. The body that she knows is now on the ground, decaying, and will be like the body of an apricot that was dead. This might be because they both have a process of bringing about life after death. The apricot allows another generation of apricots to live afterwards. However, Isaacson's grandfather was able to foster the strength that he lived in his life, similarly with his granddaughter. His involvement in her life was integral to her development in ways that no one can approximate, and this section brings this possibility to the forefront of some readers' minds. The utter simplicity and innocence that lurked behind his symbolic realization revealed that Isaacson's mind was not dulled during these frightening events. She might have realized this while writing the piece or at some moment in her history. Either way, it reinforces the perspective of both. The way this section is written through literary symbols or as keen observations, Isaacson provides many layers through what the story can be understood. Judith's relationship with her teacher, Dr. Bisco, also seems to be another instance of layers. The role of Dr. Bisco's involvement in Judith's past includes more than merely what was written in this section. When Judith is given her book for the second time, she is given it to 
keep indefinitely. This signals her and the reader that its importance is not neglected, but emphasized through this gift. Bisco's gift was an acknowledgement of the current circumstances that forced the gift. Further, the book's being a gift might have also signaled the reading and knowledge at large that was similarly still important. Another possibility is that the book stood as a memorial to the teacher-student bond that the two shared. This would be an extremely meaningful gift under this understanding because the potential seizure or destruction would not mean the end of their friendship or relationship. In a similar way that platonic forms are always in existence, the relationship created between student and teacher is one that extends beyond harsh political environments. All the while, this book might have well served as a reminder that people genuinely cared for her and that this hope still exists. Like Plato's book, the act of giving the copy of Gorgias, which is what he gave, might have empowered her to survive an abysmal chasm. The inclusion of Plato and the subsequent light that might have brought and the subsequent light that might have been brought to Judith's life might remind readers of the allegory of the cave. Plato has many allegories that add to the content in his dialogues. One focuses on knowledge. The allegory of the cave follows a person that is released from a cave and once he escapes is blinded by the light. After he exits the cave and learns about what exists beyond the cave and returns to his former narrow life, he tries to share his finding with the cave dwellers or troglodytes. However, they reject his knowledge because what he offers is not consistent with their view of the world and they try to kill him. This allegory reflects some of the struggle that Judith goes through. She is a student sent away with very few choices. Although her copy of the Gorgias affords her the remainder that the knowledge contained within. And this knowledge for her is worth dying for, and by extent, it's also worth living for. Her reading of the book brings this to an internal state as she has taken in the knowledge of her work. Dr. Bisco's seemingly small gesture of handing Judith the Gorgias made me realize that the death of caring that emphasized their relationship. He might not have been able to stop the atrocities, but he was able to explain through great literature why it was happening and what she could do about it. The Gorgias is not my favorite platonic dialogue, but one of its principal themes is the danger that often follows demagogues without proper moral guidance. This was the explanation that I referred to within the book. This giving of the copy seems to be more than a coincidence to me. This seems like a symbolic act that also leads me to see her pattern of implementing this knowledge. In the dialogue, Socrates is forced into a situation he isn't quite thrilled with and still managed to speak eloquently. This is part of Plato's genius characterization of Socrates that shines through and that he was always able to make the best out of a bad situation. Situation. Similarly, she resolutely refuses to complain or lament her situation. Instead, she realizes her similarity to food and soldiers on. Isaacson shines through and her ability to connect with readers through her successive layers that engage audiences. This happens through many methods of relating personal experiences through different contexts. The few that have been explored focus in on the ultra-personal aspects of her observations. The apricot human allegory and copy of the Gorgias both allow readers to more meaningfully engage with the experiences that she shares. The incredible quality of her writing is that she is fully capable of describing something narrow to her life in such a way that it easily becomes general for a diverse audience. Thank you so much for watching and listening in. I really appreciate you clicking on this video. If you like this, I think you're going to like a whole bunch more on this channel. And as the content on this channel continues to grow and improve, I think you'd really like to keep seeing that stuff. So if you do, please consider subscribing. Thank you so much for watching and have a great day.